Hi, welcome back. Here we are at week four. This week we're going to be addressing Simon Torres and Hager's chapter three. This is titled Cheating in Sport. A couple of key things in this section is that we'll be recalling a number of pieces we discussed in week three and give criticism to them. For example, Simon Torres and Hager are going to address Keating's take on sportsmanship and give critique to it. In addition, they're going to address intentional rules, violations, and or strategic fouling, as we discussed last week under Fraley's article. I want to just give us a quick refresher on Keating's take on sportsmanship. Obviously, we spent a good portion of our lecture last week addressing this, but I want us to review it so that we can then consider Simon Torres and Hager's arguments or critiques of this take on sportsmanship. For Keating, sportsmanship should be divided across sport and athletics. The purpose of sport is different from that of the athletics. Remember, sport is for generosity. Play is to be measured. It's a diversion. It's fun. And therefore, in order to be sportsmanlike or moral in sport, one should behave generously or with moderation. In athletics, though, Keating wanted to point us towards seriousness. And he regarded that the purpose of athletics is far different from sport. That athletics is competitive, it's intense, and it's winning focus. Therefore, athletics requires that one play with dedication and sacrifice. Lastly, I want to recall to you that Keating gave us the indication that we should behave in such a way that does not cheapen or degrade victory. And for him, that is sportsmanship and or moral in athletics. Simon Torres and Hager want to begin their critique by discussing the fact that they believe sport and athletics may not be as far as part as Keating suggests. Therefore, if they are a little closer in nature, we could see where one might behave generously even in athletics. Simon Torres and Hager offer a real-life example of a high school track runner in a 2008 state track championship. The winner of that race was disqualified for what many believed was an egregious foul. For example, she stepped on the lane line and was disqualified. The second place runner was then awarded the first spot. That second place runner, however, did not feel that what the athlete had done should have resulted in a disqualification. So that second place runner won ahead, took off her medal, and gave it to the first place runner. And in showing that she believed, even in an athletic contest, such as a state track meet, that athletes should be encouraged to move more towards values that align with and demonstrate generosity. So for Simon Torres and Hager, Keating's first critique surrounds this idea that sport and athletics should meld a little closer together than what Keating suggests. In this instance then, as in the real life example displayed with this high school track runner, the values that we see in sport could indeed fall or be displayed in various forms of athletics. Simon Torres and Hager's second critique of Keating surrounds a very interesting example. Simon Torres and Hager believe that, as I quote here, competitors in athletic contests should treat each other as partners in creation and execution of a fair test. And in the example that Simon Torres and Hager demonstrate, as we will talk about here, fair tests are important. I would like you to take a moment to watch this video clip of what, and the example given by Simon Torres and Hager, of what many would call this infamous or famous University of Colorado fifth down. Take a moment to view that and then consider this. Simon Torres and Hager want us to reflect that according to Keating's principles, in the instance, as our example here of the University of Colorado, under Keating's view of athletics, Colorado is not required to be generous and they're not required to behave with moderation. However, Keating wants to point, excuse me, Simon Torres and Hager want to point out that the resultant of this game indeed was not a fair contest. Therefore, treating opponents differently from this above precipitation rejects the very model of athletics. 
So in the instance of the University of Colorado and this infamous or famous fifth down, not treating individuals with creation and execution of a fair test goes against the very model of athletics. So in some instances, we could say that Simon Torres and Hager, going back to our previous example of the high school track runner, want us to behave more generously. And in doing so, this allows us this creation and execution of a fair test. So then, therefore, what is sportsmanship? Simon Torres and Hager have an exact take on this. And as we've pre discussed in our previous two examples, they desire that one moves more towards generosity. And we saw that as again in Keating's example of sport. So for Simon Torres and Hager, sportsmanship should involve more than generosity towards opponents or a strict following of the rules. In addition, and I like this quote, so I'm going to give it to us, sportsmanship involves not just only respect, but also some forms of positive action to protect and even enhance the principles that ethically defensible athletics presupposes. And we've seen this repeatedly in what we would include as that mutual quest for excellence. Going back to the example of our track runner in our previous slide, Simon Torres and Hager would indeed deem this as moral and sportsmanlike behavior. Why? That athlete competed at the highest level they were able to. They pushed their opponent, but they realized that in the, in the end, a fair contest and the execution of that fair contest was required for sportsmanlike behavior. And therefore the athlete, as in our example of the track runner, behaved generously. So for Simon Torres and Hager, and in their critique of Keating, want us to see that gap between sportsmanship and athletics to shorten a bit, that we could see some behaviors in sport in indeed cross over to our behaviors in athletics. And in doing so, we'll prove that sport is ethically defensible and will push each other, that is our opponents, towards a mutual quest for excellence. The early portions of chapter three in Simon Torres and Hager's text want to address this intentional rules and or strategic folly. They bring up several points from Fraley, and so I want to briefly address and remind us of Fraley's approach to intentional rules violation in sports. Recall that Fraley gave us kind of two ideas, and this again also goes back to some of our dialogue from week two. There's that formalist approach, and this is that approach where um, we fail to take into consideration the ethos of the game, but we do so with a strict following of the rules. On the other side, then, is the ethos approach. This approach wants us to consider that culture and ethos of the game. Therefore, they would view that intentionally breaking rules or these intentional rules violation is just a socially acceptable part of the game. Remember, though, that a formalist would view this in line with the incompatibility thesis. That is, breaking the rules means you're not playing, and when you're not playing, you can't win the game. Let's go on then and see how Simon Torres and Hager want to further this critique and discussion around strategic fouling and intentional rules violations. Simon Torres and Hager offer us two concerns with these kind of intentional rules violations and or strategic fouling. They demonstrate that we have become so concerned with sport surrounding winning that we willingly embrace these kind of questionable tactics in order to get a strategic advantage and ultimately improve our chances of winning. For Simon Torres and Hager, they believe, as many critics indicate, that strategic fouling destroys the vital framework of agreement of which makes sports possible. The concern then lies more in a moral principle. As we begin to emphasize winning, we've lost sight of what it takes to win honorably. And in doing so, what we are willing to do is such things as strategic following, which Simon Torres and Hager argue are somewhat questionable tactics, and we use them to get an advantage, ultimately to increase our chances of winning. 
I want us to think about some basic components or rules that address strategic following. I'm going to ask us to recall constitutive rules. We talked about those early on from Bernard Suits' article on elements of a game. He addressed these notion of constitutive rules. And just to recall our memory, constitutive rules are those that spell out the conditions that must be fulfilled in order to be playing the game. Those constitutive rules determine the kind and range of means which will be permitted in seeking to achieve those prelusory goals. And remember also that our constitutive rules are addressing those unnecessary obstacles that are put in place to work towards our achievement. And so we can also classify those constitutive rules as things that we have to demonstrate, such as complex skills. Also, we know in athletic contests, we have what are called restorative rules. These rules are in place that restore the game back to its status quo after a rules infraction. We see this, for example, in the game of basketball. If an individual has been fouled, there's a foul called, and the restorative rule is such that an, an opponent then gets to go to the free throw line to shoot free throws. And this skill is used to restore the game back to that status quo. Many argue restorative rules require simple skills. The argument then becomes around this notion of strategic fouling. And I've placed it here. Does strategic fouling simply reduce the game to simple skills? Is that what playing a game is all about? I want to go back, and I've talked previously in week three, about the notion of the strategy many began to employ in the NBA when Shaquille O'Neal was playing. That simply when Shaq crossed half court or got anywhere near the ball, he would be fouled. Shaq would then go to the free throw line to try to shoot free throws, and as we know statistically, he was a very poor free throw shooter. Many argued that this debased the game or took away from those complex skills. Shaq's team members were unable to even demonstrate complex skills because the game was debased or moved down to basic simple skills. Shaquille O'Neal going to the free throw line to try to shoot free throws. So for many, the counter argument against strategic fouling aligns in this very notion. Have we reduced the game to simple skills? And I want to recall this to our previous slide as well. Have we gone so far and have we gone so gotten so concerned with winning that we'll use any strategy to even debase the game to order to get an advantage to win? Is strategic fouling ever allowed? According to Simon Torres and Hager, there are several instances, actually, when strategic fouling is what they would call as permissible. This falls under their dialogue of the strategic fouling thesis. For Simon Torres and Hager, strategic fouling is permissible in the following circumstances. And they've also include a few others that they've listed on page 70 in their text. Strategic fouling for Simon Torres and Hager is indeed permissible when games are closely matched on constitutive skills. That is, teams and games are pushing each other to the limit, and they're actually matched on those complex skills. And they have not debased the game to what I would argue, as in our previous slide, simple skills. Simon Torres and Hager also believe strategic fouling is permissible when there are no other strategies based on the use of constitutive skills that gives a reasonable chance to win. Finally, Simon Torres and Hager give this lovely quote, and I love the word judicious. Make note of that. Judicious use of strategic fouls not only may be morally acceptable, but also may reinforce the idea of a sport contest as a worthy challenge or test of excellence. Let's think about this, for example. In close contest, when the game comes down to the mere final seconds and an opponent has indeed strategically fouled, do you want to be the team member going to the free throw line, potentially when your team is down one or two points with seconds left on the clock to shoot free throws? And so in those very instances, when there is that worthy challenge and the opponent is being tested, Many argue that shooting free throws, in our example, 
in the final seconds of the game is not merely a simple skill. It then becomes a complex skill. Think also of our example potentially in the game of football, of a field goal kicker having to kick a field goal with seconds left on the clock to win a contest. That is no longer this, what we would call potentially a simple skill, but rather it's this point where we've pushed our, our opponent, we've provided a worthy challenge, and this then offers that final test. And I know for many people, they may not want to be on that free throw line, or they may not be, want to be that person kicking the field goal in those final seconds, because it indeed is no longer just a simple skill, but it is a complex skill. So for Simon Torres and Hager, strategic fouling does have a place, a very definitive place in the world of sport and athletics. But they also want us to recognize that a number of things must fall in line for this place for strategic fouling to be acceptable. This brings us to the end of our discussion and our lecture on week four. This lecture address Simon Torres and Hager's chapter three. And make note, we have two kind of big criticisms we've addressed. We've talked about Keating's examples of sportsmanship, and we've addressed some critics, critiques excuse me, in there. Secondly, we've addressed Fraley's discussion around intentional fouls, as well as strategic fouling. And we've given critiques and offerings there. Have a good week, and I'll see you next week.